Um, welcome to our series on Jews, race, and religion. If you are joining us for the first time, my name is Steve Weitzman, and I'm the director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to um, the penultimate talk in our series on Jews, race, and religion. This program reflects a partnership between the Katz Center and the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Rabbinical Reconstructionist College. And I wanna thank the director of the center, Dr. Mira Wasserman, uh, for her role as a co-organizer, co-conceiver and co-organizer of this series. I also wanna thank our co-sponsors from Penn, which include the NSF PIDEA program, um, along with the Campaign for Community, um, which is being run out of Penn's provost office. And finally, I wanna thank um, the staff at the Kent Center uh, for making this program possible. Just one or two practical notes before I introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, next uh, Thursday is the last uh, program in the series. Um, and it is going to be a half an hour longer than normal. It's gonna run from 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 3 p.m. Because in addition to our wonderful presenter next week, uh, Dr. Shauna Sippy, uh, we're also going to spend the last 30 to 40 minutes of our time together with a panel discussion to reflect on some of the larger implications of the series and also to talk about some issues that we didn't get a chance to address over the context of the previous talks. Um, just a practical note about how this works in case you're joining us for the first time. Um, you can ask questions, but you will need to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit the questions in writing. So you can uh, submit questions either during the talk or which will run about uh, 40 minutes or so or ask questions um, uh, during the Q&A session itself. Um, after the talk part of the program, uh, we will be joined by um, both Dr. Wasserman and Dr. Ann Albert, who's the Director of Public Programs for the CAT Center, and they will be moderating the Q&A part of the program. Um, so as you know, if you've been participating in previous lectures, uh, we've been mostly focused in this series on the intersections, various intersections of race and religion in American culture and American Jewish culture. Today, which happens to be Israel's Independence Day, we're gonna be turning our attention to Israeli society, um, exploring the role of race, racism and anti-racism within Israeli Jewish society. And more specifically, we're gonna be focused on the struggles of Mizrahi Jews in contemporary Israel. Um, uh, within the larger Jewish community. Um, to speak on this topic, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Clarice Harbone, who is uh, coming to us all the way from Morocco, where she is a professor at uh, al Ahwain University. Dr. Harbone is uh, a lawyer, an activist, and a scholar who has uh, used her legal and intellectual skills to advocate for the underprivileged in Israel, including uh, Mizrahi and Mizrahi women in particular, Palestinians, the unhoused, the undocumented migrants, and others. Her initial law degree is from Tel Aviv University. And from that point forward, she became active as a founder and leader in a number of advocacy and grassroots movements, including the Jaffa Community Law Program at Tel Aviv University Law School, which she founded in 2000, and which offers um, legal assistance to Mizrahis and Palestinians in Jaffa. She was also a co-founder of ITAH, Women Lawyers for Social Justice, which was established to give a voice to women subject to discrimination in Israeli society. And she's been active as a leader in many other advocacy and grassroots organizations as well. Um, more recently, she achieved a second law degree from Yale University Law School. And from there, she went on to get a PhD at McGill University and has now been doing research on uh, the struggles of Mizrahi women against discrimination in public housing within Israel. In this and our last program, we are gonna be trying to transition from a focus on scholarship to a focus on action. And Clarice is a wonderful example of someone who's brought the two kinds of activity together. So it's a special pleasure to welcome her this afternoon, um, Dr. Harbon. Good day, everyone. It's good evening here. I'm very happy uh, to be here. I hope everybody can hear me uh, and can see me. It's the epitome of, uh, of being a feminist that I can be seen and heard at the same time. 
so before I start my talk today, I want to do two things that people know that I usually do. First, I want to address some words of gratitude. And the second, I want to grace you with a poem that is uh, uh, important uh, in depicting, depicting some of the themes of my work. So first, I want to uh, wish, you know, uh, our Muslim friends and families uh, around the world, uh, Ramadan Mubarak Said, uh, um, our, uh, our brothers and sisters of the Muslim faith are celebrating Ramadan this month, started yesterday in Morocco. Uh, and may this year be, will be marked by ending of diasporas and finding homes wherever they are. I wanna thank my clients, uh, the ones I know and the ones I've never met, um, who have shown me how it feels uh, to leave homeless uh, invisible just around the corner. I wanna thank the CAT Center for creating this important medium to discuss the important intersectional, at times both complementary and conflictual, but always relational dynamics of Jews, race, and religion. This is of special importance in the context of Mizrahi Jews suffering from structural oblivion, both in Israel and elsewhere including in academic disciplines such as Jewish studies and particularly regarding, major when, uh, regarding Mor Moroccan Jewish women born in Israel, writing about racism from the perspective of the oppressed herself. So thank you, Steve, for shaking the already imbalanced boat. Thank you for shaking it, uh, opening Jewish studies to critical race and Moroccan Jewish critique. Thank you for this. I want to thank Mira Wasserman, uh, the director of the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Thank you for, for, for creating this forum, this flora. Um, and thank you, Morocco, for opening your heart and giving us, me and my son, a home. Um, following Canadian tradition of reconciliation, I also want to thank the land wherever each of us is standing today, historically belonging to the First Nations that have lived there before. Um, so let me just share with you my screen. Bear with me. Good. Just a minute. Good. So um, I want to share my screen. I'm sharing my screen with you. And I will start with a poem. Just a second. Yes. Uh, it's called I Come From There by Mahmoud Darwish. Um, and it's very symbolic for me to use uh, the words of uh, male Muslim Palestinian uh, to describe the sense of dias diaspora within of the Jewish um, Sephardic Moroccan women born in Israel. I come from there um, and I have memories. Born as mortals are, I have a mother and a house with many windows. I have brothers, friends, and a prison cell with a cold window. Mine is the wave snatched by seagulls. I have my own view and an extra blade of grass. Mine is the moon at the far edge of the words and the bounty of birds and the immortal olive tree. I walked this land before the swords turned its living body into a laden table. I come from there. I render the sky unto her mother when the sky weeps for her mother. And I weep to make myself known to a returning cloud. I learned all the words worthy of the court of blood so that I could break the rule. I learned all the words and broke them up to make a single word, homeland. This, um, this poem depicts on many interrelated levels uh, uh, my work uh, as a human rights lawyer representing people who break the law. If I follow uh, Jewish philosophers, legal philosophers like Robert Cover, this, um, you know, this poem would also talk about the court of law, the, how the violence of the court of law, uh, which I also deal with in, in the cases I've been, uh, uh, I've been dealing with. Um, and, and obviously the notion of homeland and where is homeland and how do you carry that with you if, if you do. So as if happening these days in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or everywhere in the United States really, in 1959 in Wadi Salib, a former Palestinian neighborhood in Haifa, a community of Moroccan Jews led by David Ben Arosh rebelled against their systemic oppression and racism inflicted by Ashkenazi establishment. They were crushed, Ashkenazi Jews from uh, European uh, countries. They were crushed by the police, the courts and the public. 
in the in these pictures, as you can see, there is a young man ho that holds the flag of Israel. What you cannot see is two important things. First, the flag is stained with blood, very strong. And the second, it had a profound sentence written on it. You can see it on the screen. It says, Hassan King of Morocco, please take us back. Let us briefly reflect on this short and yet deep sentence. These people, all Moroccan Jews, were probably traditional, all traditional, Masoltiim in Hebrew, for whom Israel was supposed to be their home and refuge from the diaspora. They are now asking the Muslim kings from whom they were taken away, usually indoctrinated to believe that, they, that he was their enemy, to take them back. They want to go back to diaspora, as we say in Hebrew, to the diaspora. That begs many questions. Actually, in Hebrew, diaspora, um, galut would mean um, exile. This begs many questions, but one common thread, a sense of alienation and a diasporic, uh, diasporic identity have been created persistent, persisting nowadays at that exact home where the diaspora was meant to end. Corresponding with the subject and themes of my research, this is translated into a sense of temporality and destruction of what I call defetism, of people who do not feel any affiliation to their home. And it is this theme of feeling in exile, in diaspora at home, that is the subject of my talk today. Being a critical race feminist, where the personal is deeply intertwined with the per professional, and where context matters, especially when one of the mechanisms, as I see it, of the mechanism of oppression is that of decontextualization, I will start with a story. Um, and I will start with the story of Anita, um, and, and that would be a good starting point. Anita, obviously not a real name, pseudonym, um, it's a, a woman I met in 2001, and she's one of the most powerful women I've ever had the privilege to meet. Anita, now a 46-year-old divorced woman and a mother of three children, the youngest is now 21 years old. When we met, she was 26 and her youngest was one years old, so it's a long time ago. She squatted in public housing in Israel and faced eviction procedures. Um, and she was born to a Mizrahi family suffering from poverty and dependent on governmental support, including public housing and welfare. Anita then squatted in a public housing um, um, house and I will not repeat, you know, the story nor the different kinds of eviction procedures she faced. It's too complex for this. But what really struck me was this, what she told me on our first meeting, explaining why she had squatted. And it says on this, on, on this slide, she said, you know, Clarice, all I want is to live in dignity. I too have the right, to, uh, a right to have a home where I can feel safe. Now, this short yet deep sentence bore profound significance and, the, um, and, and using the language of rights, um, she drew a correlation between the rights to a home and dignity. And these were translated into relational notions of safety. Th these words have sparked what has soon become my own quest for a home. Uh, she has motivated me to further research her and indeed our shared historical context of racism and discrimination in Israel. I was confronted with many interrelated questions, legal, religious, gender, ethical, moral, and historical. I wanted to know, this is what I've learned, why all my squatting clients were Mizrahi women, particularly Moroccan women, Jewish Moroccan women. Why do Mizrahis do not have or own a home? Why doesn't she feel safe? What is she, what is it that she is yearning for? Just safety or something bigger, deeper, like a sense of belonging or longing to belonging, a, per, a sense of permanence. How can one, how can a home then inhibit and house uh, both safety and unsafety? In general, Israeli law is not sympathetic to acts of squatting or to the woman involved. Um, they end up being evicted. Following Western legal tradition, the courts are committed to preserving the positive uh, premise of the rule of law, preferring, uh, preferring state-centered legalism. They approach these cases internally, viewing the squatting woman as an autonomous individual, isolated from any group affiliation and devoid 
of larger external normative universes, as Robert Carver would say. I, however, felt that this internal approach did not and could not explain why these acts, explain these acts of lowbreaking. I felt that it oversimplified these acts, trivializing this particularity, their particularities and context, and thus missed the richness embedded in them. Lawrence Friedman, a legal historian from Stanford, wrote about the importance of shifting the, fo the legal focus from the big cases as, a, quote, to the day-to-day -day happenings of small events. Shifting then the focus to these women themselves, I adopted various, various critical inductive and contextual approaches to law and methods to explain social legal phenomena. These approaches, especially critical race feminisms, and critical legal approach um, uh, feminism. These are approaches that shift the focus from the state to, to society, to the individual herself, and put real life at the center, right? They provide different ways to think about law as a living language and process. Following Eugene Ehrlich's, the so-called forefathers of, uh, forefather of the sociology of law, uh, the, concept of, uh, uh, the concept of living law um, um, he, he coined the concept of living law, and he said the key to understand the present lies in the past. So the acts of law of squatting in the present then should put, be put in a wide past context and explained as a response and 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 uh, and in relation to these past. So I approach these pieces like an archaeologist whose work focuses on the small, broken and non-homogeneous, non-uniform pieces. I started digging and looking at particular and concrete de details of these pieces, of these women, and at the linkages between these women, bringing them together, assembling them into a bigger piece. What is important is that it is the ongoing processes entailed in real life. It's, it's uh, concrete and actual events all tied together and placed on a larger unbounded continuum of past, present, and future. Mizrahi women squatting then can be put in an historical context. What I've discovered is what I've already known intuitively, namely that these women shared not only gender and class as, uh, uh, as women suffering from poverty, but also they shared ethnicity as Mizrahi women, mostly, well, particularly Moroccan women. I began to read history into their acts. Using the eloquent words of Patricia Williams, um, um, I discovered, quote, that property might have a gender and that gender might be a matter of words. I started reflecting on some questions, dialoguing with the concept of home. And I asked questions like, what is a home? What constitutes or create a home in Israel? What makes a home? A house home? Can a house steal or construct one's identity? And can it be used to deconstruct it? What creates and deprives a sense of belonging to a home, a country, a people, a nation? How does one restore, erase memories to a home? Particularly, and this is a key point, I offer a new understanding of the role of home, particularly public housing in Israel as a site of both oppression, right? Dispossessing in this case, Mizrahis of their homes and homeland, culminating, culminating in instilling feelings of homelessness and dias dias diasporic identities, but at the same time, as sites of resistance and agency. Even reconciliation generating what I call defiant memories and social justice redefining, in, in the case of Israel, redefining Israeli property law, um, a home as a project of both memory and forgetting. Starting digging into my clients and, in, and my own past, I started learning about the stories that I, as a Moroccan woman, was deprived of and the ones I was forced to adopt. And indeed, taking a critical perspective, exploring the historical context in which squatting occurs I found that Mizrahi women squatters were second and third generation Mizrahi women uh, whose parents, most of whom from North, uh, are North African and mostly Moroccan, were brought to Israel between 1952 to 72. 
So what is this historical context that is important to understand uh, in, in order to understand the, this notion of di diaspora within? In order to understand this historical context uh, of Jews from Arab and Muslim countries and the sense of, of dislocation and appurtenantness, it is important for me to first pause a minute on the notion of what do I mean by home? Okay, I find that homes bear two intertwined aspects. One is the conceptual home, if I can call it, or spiritual home. That is of the Jewish home of Israel, right? Um, Israel as a home. And the second, I call it the physical home, that is the actual housing. And in the context of Mizrahi, usually public housing in the context, in this context, in Israel, okay? So corresponding with these two conceptual and two conceptual and physical aspects of, of the home of and in Israel, I identify two intertwined themes. Um, yes, both are constitutive of and con constituted by each other and are central in creating notion of dislocation and notion of di diaspora. First is what I call the discursive uh, dislocation uh, and homelessness, or 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 dias the discourse of diasporic dislocation, focusing namely on the oppressive systemic and intentional rhetoric of racism used by Israeli governments against Mizrahis, alienating them from feeling so feeling at home in Israel, and leading to and further perpetuated by the second theme, which I call the practical dislocation or the practical sense of diaspora through the use of actual discriminatory policies. For example, Israeli land regime and public housing policies depriving them from having a home in Israel. So feeling at home, having a home, okay? I argue that these two modi operandi had a central performative role in instilling and constructing feelings and relations of homelessness of Mizrahis in their homes and homeland. Mizrahis left their Jewish home in their countries of origin, wishing to, wishing to return to their Jewish homeland. However, through the practices directed against them, they were dispossessed of their memories and sense of belonging, creating deep feelings of homelessness and witlessness in the Jewish homeland herself. And as I show, as I show in my research, ironically, it was in Israel that was supposed to be their refuge from the dangers of diasporic uh, homelessness, you know, the, the, the sentence we know called people with no land, it, that, that they have, that in this country they have developed a diasporic identity as outsiders within, as people with no home. So let me start with the, with the first, with the idea of this discursive dislocation uh, and homelessness. Jews from Arab and Muslim countries, um, or as, as, as also known as Mizrahis, are Jews who have become a minority diaspora in Israel, enduring continuously institutionalized racism by Ashkenazi establishment. They are a social and cultural category that was invented by Ashkenazi Zionism in the same manner that Orientalism was invented by the West. This notion of who is Mizrahi is in and of itself what I call a praxis of exclusion through unification, as Mizrahis are not a real geopolitical entity, and yet they have been nevertheless unified as one distinct entity while attempting uh, successfully to eradicate uh, their cultures. All Jews of the Arab and Muslim worlds, uh, countries were clustered under one reductionist and oversimplistic category. Uh, from which it was easier to discipline them, right? They took Jews from Morocco, which in, you know, from the Maghreb, which are in Arabic means actually West, and they put them in the same category with Jews from, you know, Iran or Afghanistan that, you know, have nothing, nothing in common, nothing geographical, perhaps some perhaps spiritual or, uh, but not, nothing geopolitical uh, uh, to identify them as, 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 as the same. Um, so the oppressive and violent uh, processes of exclusion that they have confronted are complex and go far beyond the scope of our talk today. For the, for the sake of for our purposes, suffice to say that the oppression has inc incapacitated every aspect of their lives 
and it has, ma has been manifested in inten intentional and systemic lack of access to education, employment, monetary resources, and housing. They were subject to several eugenic based policies from Ashkenazi kidnapping of thousands of Yemenite, uh, of Jewish Yemenite, Mizrahi and Balkan babies uh, and placing them for adoption by Ashkenazi families, also known as the Yemenite babies affair. It's, it's an ongoing issue going on in Israel, um, uh, the subject of demonstrations in Israel at the moment too. Two of the radiation experiments, especially on, on Jewish Moroccan children known as the ringworm affair to name only a few. They were dehumanized and have been referred to, amongst others, as Schwarzechayes, Black animals in Yiddish, or Indians um, in the North American context, using the latter as a derogatory term explicitly referring to their alleged primitiveness and savagery. Strikingly, though not surprisingly, considering the wider context of subordination whereby whiteness and blackness are not merely colors of skin, Jews from Arab and Muslim world uh, were compared using David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, using his words to the black slaves who were brought to America. Ashkenazi leaders tried to portray the bringing of these Jews as a heroic endeavor, saving and rescuing them from their decadent Levantine culture. These are all quotes. They were perceived as third world children, uh, deprived of the parental capacity of controlling their lives without the benevolent help of the more adult and advanced society. The Mizrahi narrative was perceived as endangerment to the Western uh, and civilized so-called meta foundations of the Ashkenazi ethos. El Shohat, for example, argues that the fear of the Mizrahis has been deeply linked to their Eastern otherness. Right, especially their Arabness, viewed as endangering, endangering the idea of the homogeneous Israeli nation. Especially, you know, we're talking to today about the, you know, the the, day, the 1948 day. Um, so let us pause on some of the foundational racist rhetoric underlying the discriminatory practices uh, um, uh, that are based on and stemming from it. Let me sh let me share with you some of the quotes. So Ben Gurion, for example. Right, um, call them savages, the most elementary knowledge, and without a trace of Jewish human education, Golda Meir, uh, compared it to the Middle Ages, shall we be able to elevate these immigrants to a suitable level of civilization? Karl Frank Frankenstein, uh, a known, uh, a renowned academic, the head of the School of Education in Hebrew University, and a recipient, I, I thought, I think, of Pras Israel, one of prestigious awards whose theories together with another one, Eisenstadt, are still taught in education schools uh, uh, in Israel, describe the Mizrahis, as he says, uh, as, as an ethnic problem. We have, you, ha you, have, you have it written on, your, on the slide, we have to recognize, he says, uh, the primitive mentality of many of the immigrants from the backwards country. He compared their mentality to, it's a quote, I'm sorry for using those words, the primitive expression of children, the retarded and the mentally disturbed. Um, Arie Goldblum, 1949, wrote in Itona Aretz that we celebrate as a leftist one, right? He wrote, this is, this is immigration of a race we have not yet known in the country, right? He says, we are dealing with people whose primitive, primitivism is at peak, whose level of knowledge is one of virtually absolute ignorance and whose and worse, who have little talent for understanding anything intellectual. Generally, they are, they are only slightly better than gen general level of Arabs, Negroes, and bear bears. You, sorry to use derogatory terms uh, in the same regions. In any case, they are at an even lower level than what we knew with regard to the former Arabs of Eretz Israel, of Israel. Let's move on. Shaftai Kol, in response to him, right? He says, primeval um, um, uh, material, a sort of a dough that can be kneaded to the best ability and will of the baker. Good natured children who are awaiting a hand that would mold them. These childlike Jews with their simplicity are tonic against the intellectual nitpicking, which was the source of many misfortunes and so forth. Um, we've read. Karl Frankenstein, a physician 
talking in one of the camps, right? How can one build a people's future on such ruins of human souls? If we fill the houses which, uh, which we are building and the lands which we, are, uh, uh, um, which we maintain um, with, with them, uh, we will become an indolent people and one vast public welfare office. Um, Amnon, um, Amnon Danknel. Before that, Carmen Katzenelson. Um, Carmen Katzenelson, it's not on the slides, perhaps is one of the worst manifestation of this rhetoric is the book entitled The Ashkenazi Revolution, written by Carlson, uh, Carmen Katzenelson. In his book, Katzenelson described the dangers posed by this to the superi superiority of the Ashkenazi state and race by the Mizrahi who suffered uh, from irreversible genetic inferiority, right? He urged the establishment of an apartheid, quote, apartheid regime that among other limitation would abolish their political rights. Uh, he opposed mixed marriages and demanded to prohibit the use of Arabic and Hebrew and so forth. So this was a very uh, dehumanizing rhetoric of darkness versus light which quoting from Fratz Fanon in Wretched of the Earth, as he says, to speak plainly, and I'm tailoring his quote to the Mizrahis, uh, he said that this kind of rhetoric turned the Mizrahis into the animal, into an animal. In fact, the terms that the, uh, the settlers, Ashkenazi settlers used when they mentioned the Mizrahis were zoological terms. That's a quote from the Wretched of the Earth. That's a way to refer to the colonized in terms of, of an animal, zoological and bestiary term. For example, Amnon Dankner, you see that on your slide, a known journalist from Israel seeking, seeking in a typical Fanonian colonizing fashion to describe the Mizrahis fully in exact terms, he constantly referred to the bestiary. And listen to this. This is a war, this war is not going to be between brothers. Not because there is not going to be a war, but because it won't be between brothers. Because if I am a partner in this war, which is imposed on me, I refuse to name the other side my brother. Um, these are not my brothers. These are not my sisters. Leave me alone. I have no sister. They put me in the same cage with an hysterical baboon, and they tell me, okay, now you are together. So begin the dialogue. Speak to him nicely. Throw him a banana. After all, you people are brothers. So we're, we're talking about comparing um, human beings uh, into, um, into animals. Shulamit Aloni, uh, former, um, late Shulamit Aloni, former member of parliament and a minister, considered to be one of the most leftist politician. Her legacy is celebrated all over the world. It's important so you can see it's overarching everyone around the spectrum. So her legacy is celebrated all over the world in leftist circles as one of love of humankind and an uncompromising commitment to justice, especially in the Palestinian context, equality and peace. It, though in 1983, for example, she refers to Mizrahi demonstrations as barbarous tribal forces uh, that were driven like flock with tumtums and chanting like savage tribes. Haim Hefel, uh, Natan Zach that you have, poets, Chaim Hefer, a very famous uh, national songwriter. He says, most of the Moroccans have not understood the idea of what we call Western world. And this is recent. Uh, well, relatively in the 19, in the 2000, perhaps their development is, is soon to come. Perhaps it's happening now, but whatever they brought from Morocco is nothing of importance. What did they bring? Mufletot, um, it's a kind of a crepe, uh, a culture of tombstones. Uh, Natan Zach, a poet. There arose the idea of taking people who have nothing in common. The one lot comes from the highest culture. There is, you know, Western civilization, Western culture, and uh, uh, the other one comes from caves. Um, Ori O, and so on and so on. See this. Um, um, Another one is Anat Offman, for example. Anat Offman, you don't have the slide, but Anat Offman um, used to be the, or still is, I don't know, the chairwoman of, uh, of, uh, of Women of the Wall. And she says this, every ethnic group, that's a very strong sentence. Every ethnic group brought its own import. Hmm. 
The Moroccans brought me Muna and the Americans brought equality. I guess she doesn't read the news uh, and so forth. Israel used, um, um, Israel used inclusive exclusive mechanisms that work simultaneously placing Mizrahis within an impossible Israeli continuum. If I can borrow uh, a, a theme from Adrian Rich uh, um, um, of, in, her, in her seminal work, uh, Compulsory um, uh, Heterosexuality, so they were located between what I call the hammer of compulsory Israeliness that has tried to assimilate them into an imaginary Israeliness and to er erase any cultural characteristic with which they came from there, and an anvil of compulsory Mizrahiness, right? Aimed at constituting the relations of dominance and subordination by way of opposition to an identified, well, imaginary other. This has resulted in a situation where Mizrahis have been entrapped between inability to assimilate into the mainstream on one hand and inability to mobilize a competing communal project. Borrowing from Dubois, they have been entrapped in what he calls double consciousness of their unreconciled two-ness. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful concept of being both Israeli Jews and Mizrahi. From this and against big, this backdrop stems the second oppressive theme, right? The first one that was the discursive diaspora, the language, the rhetoric. The, the most important thing on top of, of on which the practical aspects that I'm, I'm about to talk about are, are you know, are based on. So um, the practical dislocation uh, and homelessness. Um, and I will, um, and, and as I said earlier, the oppressive and violent processes of exclusion that Mizrahis have confronted are complex and, 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 for, and go far beyond the scope of our seminar today. For these purposes, I will repeat what I said earlier, that the oppression encompasses every aspect of their life, like lack of like, like access to education, employment, monetary resources, and housing. Housing, on which I focus both scholarly and practically, is an example of these kind of practices. Um, as in other settler societies, one of the main discriminatory mechanisms used to ensure its ethnocratic hegemony was Israel's differential land regime, and particularly its public housing policy based on ethnic selection, also known as from the boat to the permanent house, prior, prioritizing Ashkenazi. Mizrahis were used as a means for spatial, spati, spatial Judaizing of the empty Negev and the Galilee, Negev the south, the Galilee the north, and as the human security wall along the border, securing Israeli territorial continuing and continuum and preventing Palestinians fedayim, the infiltrators that's supposed to come back to their own home. Um, they were settled in distant peripheries, mostly in developmental towns, according to the goals set forth by the government, its needs, standards, and conditions, regardless of their preferences or needs. The houses were very small. The quality of construction was usually lower than the standards used for Ashkenazis and sometimes even lacked elementary equipment such as kitchens and bathrooms. Um, Mizrahis who left most of their capital and property in their home countries feared that their only option was either homelessness or tents in immigrant transit camps. In fact, they were forced to stay and were threatened with sanctions. They they had therefore no choice but to comply with their allocation in remote areas of Israel. In contrast, Ashkenazi immigrants coming to Israel at the same time were formally and informally prioritized by the government, offering them better, attractive, and more adequate housing opportunities. More importantly, they were encouraged to purchase their homes with governmental subsidies uh, and become homeowners. Studies show that these policies were not depending on timing, on timing and availability of property. It was based, uh, it was a question of ethnicity, of identity. As sharply put by a uh, member of parliament, Itzhak Raphael, at the Jewish agency meeting in, in 1950, preference, he says, should be twofold. The Polish Jews should be given a higher priority for housing and better benefits in the camps. In fact, by the late 1951, the Jewish agency had adopted 
adopted a selective immigration policy, allowing only the fit to immigrate. And who's and, and, and any who seemed unfit uh, were disqualified. Ben Gurion justified the policy, saying, "Quote: It's true there is discrimination, but it is unavoidable um, or necessary. Depends how you uh, um, translate that. Unavoidable uh, discrimination." Let me just quickly share some slides with you. You can see. Let me move the. the yes, exactly. It's just been bothering. Um, Yes, um, Yuda Braginsky, uh, one of the officials, for example, he says you can see in the part that is uh, uh, bolded, all around the table are Russians or Polish, all are white, and all have deep feelings regarding the last remaining immigrants from Poland who've been unable to immigrate until now. They didn't want to send them to, to the same places where Edota Mizrach, the, the, the Mizrahis live. There, are, there were various excuses. We said to ourselves, these Jews are not like the previous one, right? He's correlating between color, race, and, 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 and Judaism, right? I mean, Polish Jews is white and Moroccan would be the opposite then. Braginski again, Clarice, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you've accidentally muted yourself. Just the last 30 seconds or so. No worries. I mean, it's better for me to mute myself and not on no one else. Thank you. Um, um, Braginsky, for example, says, we can't send poles to canvas huts uh, and shacks. We cannot do this, he says. Um, not only because the housing is bad, he's actually you know, uh, admitting that the housing is bad, but because of, of the population that will will surround them, right? And it goes on, uh, on and on. Um, 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 you have also here Giora Yosefthal. Our impression is the average individual has no idea what the Jewish establishment is doing. There's no escaping of the bureaucracy of papers and instructions and interviews, he says, and, and the rest. And the system is such that after a few months, um, as Braginsky once told me, that individual will ask, how on earth did I get to this wilderness? They haven't the vaguest notion of the entire procedures they've been through. Just a feeling of deceit as well. And it goes on, on, and on. So let me just move forward. Mizrahis uh, have found themselves imprisoned in public houses as contractual tenants with weak legal status. Uh, subject to arbitrary public housing companies that could easily evict them uh, from their homes. Those few who could have left did so. More importantly, they were deprived of the fair opportunity to purchase their homes and enlarge their family capital designated for inheritance as a means of securing their children's socioeconomic status, giving them a chance in life. Through the intentional design, size, location, and low quality of the construction and material use, public housing policies dictated one-dimensional relationships based on dependency with the outside world. Public housing affected the inner structure of their families, modes of parenting, gender roles, and relationships, and even health, and created a sense of temporality and detachment to their homes. Their homes have become a place to live in not a home to belong to, not a home that is being lived in. From the beginning then, public housing in Israel was constituted by and based upon Eurocentric and ethnocratic ideals of hegemonic territorial control. It wasn't based on necessity and on dependency on the state intervention resulting from econ an economic hardship and poverty, but rather uh, on ethnicity. Everybody needed housing. They were immigrants. Everybody came to Israel at the same time. Needed. They were not poor. They were immigrants. So they all needed a housing. Their poverty, their status, their dependency was created because of these public housing. They were not a solution to a poverty. They were the creators of that poverty. These differential ethnocratic uh, mechanisms had a central structuring role uh, in the stratification system of Mizrahis in Israel. They resulted in creating and further perpetuating the correlation between housing and ethno class in Israel. 
Israel of 2021 is a place where Mizrahi suffer from poverty with an everlasting increasing socioeconomic gaps between them and Ashkenazis, educational underachievement, both in schools and higher education, high rate of unemployment, intergenerational dependence of governmental welfare support and public housing, and comprising the majority of prisoners in Israeli prisons. There are daily cases of discrimination in admission to schools, police brutality, ethnic profiling in restaurants, bars, clubs, and discrimination in employment, to name only a few. Mizrahis are the subject of ridicule in movies, satire programs, school curricula, and commercials. Mizrahi music is prevented from getting into the playlist of official radio stations. But most importantly, there has been a growing and entrenched sense of dislocation and alienation and inferiority that does not receive any public, let alone uh, institutional recognition. Mizrahis have been entrapped in what I call the diaspora within. Going back to our picture um, in Wadi Salid, Moroccan Jews then asked their king to take them back. Jews from the Arab and Muslim countries have developed a sense of temporality that is best reflected in the neglected state of public housing in Israel. In, in order to understand that the sense of um, temporality and dislocation, I wanna share with you how in 2021, this is the independence of the state of Israel. Now it's probably showing its strength. This is how people live. Um, you know, gas, the gas is one of the most dangerous things that you see the gas outside. Uh, this is a typical look of a public housing project. Um, and it's, uh, I chose, and all the pictures are, um, it's never pictures of my clients. It's a pictures from online. Uh, and you have here the, obviously the reference. Uh, I find it uh, I find it a little bit uh, um, ironic to see the little kids here, the angels in this in this help. This is a typical kitchen. People striving to keep decency uh, in the midst of of mold and and electricity exposed. This is public housing. They're supposed to be paying for that uh, mold. Um, you can see how people live, um, trying to. Uh, how can you feel you know, permanent in a house into a nation with this is how you live? Um, mold everywhere. I had clients suffering from asthma and a lot of respiratory diseases that I said I, I, I connected to the state of these houses. Look, exposed walls and wires. Um, look at this room, children's room, people trying to keep their dignity with the you know, Minnie Mouse and the teddy bears with mold everywhere, the smell. Um, so this, this, look at this, look at this kitchen, right? Um, this is a, a typical eviction. Again, that's from online and, and I feel that I'm actually invading into her privacy, but, uh, but this is how it's done. They're just, and they've been evicted on Hanukkah. If you see the menorah behind her, where a miracle is supposed to happen. Um, so, and so this is, you know, begs the question, how can you feel at home when this is your home? So people are evicted. The state does not recognize their affiliation to their homes. So look at this slide, okay? Uh, this disturbing, this uh, banner thing here. Oops, there you go. Don't know how to minimize it. Um, okay, so do you see this slide? It's a, uh, I don't know if you read Hebrew, but there is a song. It says, This is where I was born. This is where my children were born. This is where I built my home into with my two hands. This is a home in the village of Givat Amal, uh, uh, a Mizrahi place was evicted. And I found it very strong because the first thing that was broken, that the, the, the hammer broke from everything, from the birth, you know, they didn't break the where I was born or where my children, they broke the word home. This is very symbolic. Kan baniti et beiti bishteyadai. This is the whole. It's supposed to be a sentence. This is where I built my home between, within my two hands. Um, this, um, so it deeply summarizes the sense of destruction of defeatism. And yet it is exactly here at this moment of defeat uh, and at, at these same sites of dislocation and alienation where resistance, agency, and protest rise. Reversing the same mechanism of oppression. If only these walls could talk, then these walls would have told you a story, also a story of defiance. Let me move the slide. 
Um, I just hear, I wrote The Caged Bird Sings. It's a sentence from, uh, from Maya Angelou, um, the, the, ca the caged bird. Uh, and I put, uh, put three pictures. Again, going back to the Wadi Salib, the Mizrahi Jews, there is the march uh, to Selma, and there is also Minneapolis. Uh, 2020. So, you know, the idea of the intergenerational cross uh, Atlantic uh, and transnational idea of solidarity and, and protest. Maurice, it's Mira. Uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm uh, concerned about time. So we have yes, I am. I'm almost I'm almost done. I'm right. almost done. So I would, you know, so from here, I will quickly, I will quickly uh, go 1971, the Moroccan Black Panthers in Israel have, have risen, uh, adopting very strong, uh, adopting the language of the Black Panthers in Israel. That drove Golda Meir at the time, it drove her nuts. She was really scared of the, uh, of the dialogic alliances created by Moroccan Jews and Blacks in the United States, you know. Uh, this is a, a very strong picture of an Ethiopian, uh, so, well, well, soldier, it's, it's a kind of a soldier evicting uh, a, a woman from Gibat Amal. So there is a, you know, and in the, in, in the background, there is those uh, great uh, uprising, um, well, an uprising um, uh, buildings uh, in Tel Aviv. So at this same time, there is resistance. Look at this one at Gibat Amal, the house is being and this is something I found very strong. These people are eating, I can see that they're eating chamin on Shabbat uh, within the destruction. Look at this. So this is this is the diaspora within, within, you know, in the middle of these big, expensive, you know, skyscrapers of, of fancy Tel Aviv, people losing their homes and being evicted because they don't have entitlement for that land. So I, I, I will probably resume by saying that the same sense of resistance uh, that um, some protest groups in Israel, Mizrahi and mostly Moroccan have adopted as also manifested in my own narrative as well. Uh, I've been involved in representing protesters and representing lawbreakers, but all the more so I was also deeply, uh, deeply influenced by American, uh, Black American uh, uh, scholarship uh, from you know, Du Bois and Sojourner Truth to Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Williams and Angela Davis. This Black American, speaking of race and color, has given me words, uh, if I would say, to theorize what I've been carrying intu um, intuitively and have given me a context to understand that I'm not really alone. There's people, other, other people in the world that are suffering dislocation and sense of alienation. And I needed those words in order to feel that sense of, um, uh, um, of solidarity. I will, I will end uh, by, by saying that, um, you know, these women have taught me that a house is not just uh, the women I've been representing, and it's been manifested in my work. Uh, what I've been what I've been uh, arguing in court that these women, for example, that squat into public housing, take uh, 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 take what could have been and should have been theirs that property been allocated equally, and that their law breaking is a form of lawmaking. And I've been calling them affirmative squatters, and that has been adopted in certain circles in Israel. Uh, uh, these women squatters, so affirmative squatters. So these women have, have taught me that a house is not just a roof over your head, is, is, is a sense of belonging. It's history and it's your memories. I'll, start, I'll just end with a quote from Maya Angelou, uh, the caged bird. And she says this, a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks with down his narrow cage can seldom see through their bars of rage. His, way, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his, his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bear, bird sings of freedom. I guess in this day of independence, however it's being celebrated, I wish to everyone to be able to break through those bars and to be able to sing uh, um, even inside the bars and may our songs be heard in any distant hill. May it be Capitol Hill legally, not insurrectionally, and or, or any hill in the world. I, uh, I wish you all a uh, um, um, happy rest of the day and I hope you enjoy my talk.
Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple uh, minutes for question and answer. So if you stop sharing the screen, we can at least see each yes. other. Yes. Um, yes. Dr. Harbon, thank you so much for a presentation that was incisive and fierce and illuminating and inspiring. Uh, we have a lot of questions. We don't have time for a lot of questions. Um, but uh, one thing, it, it, it was a provocative beginning when you started with that um, beautiful poem by a Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish. And I wonder if you can say a word about um, uh, possibilities for solidarity between Mizrahi Jews and Palestinians, um, what you've seen on the ground or uh, what uh, you think there might be a foundation for. That's um that's a wonderful question. Um, do I answer it now or answer it now? Why don't you answer that one and then yes. hope, but briefly and then maybe we can um, have a couple more questions. So that's a that's a very that's an ongoing uh, that's an ongoing debate. You know the solidarity. I guess that I always say um, Israel cannot proceed with the Palestinian until it recognizes the Arab within. So you cannot proceed into making a peace with the Arab when you do not accept the Arab that is inside you. Uh, I've been involved in many, in many occasions working Palestinian women. So for me, Palestinian can be also Palestinian living in Israel. So Palestinian from Palestine or Palestinian with Israeli yes, uh, citizenship. Um, so we've been working on, uh, on numerous, uh, numerous um, forms of solidarity. But the idea is to find this common ground that we're both suffering from this kind of otherness uh, of an oppressor that doesn't see you as valid, does, that doesn't see your culture as something that you can, he or she can acknowledge, something that they can negotiate with, sometimes eat hummus, I don't know, and feel that they are, but not really acknowledge the culture behind that hummus, behind that, uh, behind that, uh, 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 that person. So there are places of solidarity, but it's very important, speaking of, you know, politics of identity or policy for representation. And I always I just said that in class today to my students. I don't know if they're here, but I make sure that I don't end up speaking for Palestinians. Right. Especially, you know, I don't want to appropriate their voice. What I do in the context of accountability and reconciliation, I shift the geese to myself and talk about my role as a Mizrahi, as a Jew, as an Israeli, that on one hand, I'm you know, second best Israeli, but I'm still a Jew, right? So it allows me what Palestinians cannot. And I'm not comparing myself. That's another, that's a second theme. I'm not into the hierarchy of suffering. You know, they, I, I don't want to be in their position. And yet I said to one of my friends, there was a poem I wrote many years ago, I wish I were a Palestinian in many ways, at least my identity would have been just firm. That's it. You're Palestinian. You're an outsider. Whereas the Mizrahis, nobody really acknowledges their existence. What do you mean? You're not a Mizrahi. You don't. You don't look different. You don't look black. So on one hand, you ex you exclude me. You call me the Arab Jew, and yet you don't allow me to call myself that way. So it's kind of a it's kind of a dual you know uh, dual game all the time. So a yes solidarity, but working together and no one leading each. Not, not us leading them. I don't want to appropriate their voice on top of appropriating everything else. Uh, and, and also understanding that we, we're not comparing suffering. Uh, and the suffering is everybody has their own ways of, uh, of dealing with their sufferings. Everybody has a, might have similar victimizer, but, but the victim, victim, victims might be a little bit different because at the end of the day, I can negotiate my Israeliness within Israel with Palestinians cannot. So I hope that answer is a little bit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I am mindful of the time and I realize uh, that unfortunately we're going to uh, have to honor the time limits and um, say uh, a warm thank you to Dr. Harbone for um, a really uh, rich, presentation today, which give us, uh, gives us so much um, to think about. And, uh, and I see that there's been an, uh, an active exchange in the Q&A as well. So thanks for everyone, to everyone um, for participating um, in that exchange. 
uh, we, as Steve mentioned in the beginning, we have just uh, one more meeting together next week. It will be extended to allow us to do some um, synthetic work, integrating some of the insights from the various lectures that we've seen. Um, and our lecturer next week is Professor Shana Sippy. We'll have a chance to uh, continue engaging with themes of activism and the connection between scholarship and theory and action on the ground. So I look forward to seeing everybody next week. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And the uh, are hard amazing. Work. Is there a way I can engage with them afterwards? Is there some really great feedback and questions here? If you what? are welcome, we would love to use the website to have uh, an online exchange. So we, we will hold on to these questions. We can share them with you. And if there are individual questions that you want to address in writing, we can get that out uh, to all the participants. I would love that. Yes, for thank sure. You. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that invitation. Um, and thanks to everyone for being with us uh, and for engaging. All the best. Bye, Chag Sameach, everyone. Chag <laughs> Sameach.